Um, I appreciate that. So we, uh, we actually started this series last week about the power of choices and some choices that we can make that uh, th- th- there's some choices in our life we don't, we don't know the outcome for. And, and we don't, should we buy? Should we sell? You know, you know should, should we take the job? Should we not take the job? That kind of thing. Uh, those are open-ended. We, we're not sure we can apply wisdom to those and that, that kind of thing. But we, we, it's just really hard to know which of those choices we should make. But there are some choices in life that you can't go wrong making them. And last week we said one of them is to take the next step of growth in our faith. That uh, if you were with us in the park, and I hope you were with us in the park, we had a good time. Uh, but we did talk about um, that, that Jesus called us to follow him, to grow in him, to be discipled by him, to make, uh, make our, our, our faith a lifestyle and not just something that's on the side. Uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about an, another choice. And, and so, um, so many of us are, struggle with relationships. How many of you have ever struggled with a relationship before of, of any kind? Uh, moms, this, this, here, here's the thing. Mother's Day is great, but I don't know of any mom that doesn't have some re- regrets. Re- moms just... I stopped preaching about Mother's Day a long time ago because I, I realized it doesn't matter how I preach about Mother's Day. Someone is overwhelmed with guilt and it ends up not being a positive thing, okay? And so, so moms, I just want to recognize that relationships, even with your kids, don't always go well. Um, and uh, Mother's Day is tough for for some moms, it's a fantastic day for, for others mom, other moms, but for some folks, it's a day of loss. Uh, for others, it's, it's a day of a loss because, um, uh, because they've not been able to be mothers. Uh, for some of us, it's, it's a day of loss because our moms are gone or a part of our relationship that we hope to have with our mom is gone. So relationships are, are really tough, but relationships are also something that is God given. And so we're going to look at a passage of scripture real quick. That if you've been around the church, you've, you've seen this passage of scripture. And you know one part of this passage of scripture really well. Um, and uh, um, and it's, it's a beautiful passage of scripture. And so um, it is Ruth chapter 1. If you have your Bible or on your phone or something like that. And you want to look at Ruth chapter 1. We're going to look at parts of the chapter uh, but, uh, but you might want to have the whole thing open and we're going to talk about choosing community. Okay. Would you do me a favor? Um, we're going to read, uh, this passage of scripture and I'd like you to stand with me as we read that, uh, for the reading of God's word. Okay. Now, um, Elimelech, Naomi's husband died. It's a great way to start the morning, isn't it? Happy Mother's Day once again. Um, And she was left with her two sons. So she at least has something going. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, the other Ruth. And after they had lived there about 10 years, both of her sons, Melon and Kilion, also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons. And her husband. Let me just tell you, if you know anything about loss, the Bible describes loss. God is accustomed to loss. And if you are feeling the sting of loss this morning, you've come to the right place. Uh, God understands your heart. And God also has healing for your heart. Later on in the story... Uh, Naomi, because of this, she, she says, I'm, I'm turning bitter. <laughs> and she tells her two daughter-in-laws, I'm, go- I'm tired of where we live. I'm tired of these people. I'm tired of their ways. I'm going back home where I grew up. And I'm going to uh, be around my people. And I'm going to go there to die. So you two, I know you're sad as well. Go to your homes. And one of them decides to, the other one stays behind. And here's, here's the rest of this. At this, they wept again because, because she wanted her daughter-in-laws to go away. Then Orpah, 
kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, even if death separates you and me. What a beautiful passage. Heavenly Father, bless the reading of your word. And may it find its place in our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to somebody and say, this is going to be fun, and then find a seat. All right? Okay. So in this passage of Scripture, we find something just uh, very serious going on here. Um, Naomi has lost a lot. She has lost her husband, and she has lost her two sons. Her daughter-in-laws have lost their husbands, and it's a, it's a sad time. Aren't you glad that Scripture isn't just all uh, positive thinking and, um, you know, turn that frown upside down and that kind of thing? Aren't you, aren't you glad it doesn't change stories so that they're all encouraging stories? Because I don't know about you, but as I go through life, not every part of life is real encouraging to me. Is it for you? Anybody here ever been discouraged in life? Just raise your hand, all right? Yeah. And so maybe you're going through it right now, uh, but I just want you to know God doesn't leave you in those moments. Those are incredible moments where if you will allow him, God can speak loudly to you. And so, uh, uh, so, so as we check this out, Naomi tells her daughter-in-laws, I don't want you to call me Naomi anymore. I don't want you to do that. I want you to call me Mara. So let's, let's look at those two words. Naomi, her name means sweet. Isn't that beautiful? How many of you have mother-in-laws whose names should be sweet? Anybody here? All right, we've got a couple. And I'm assuming the rest of you are thinking, yeah, there's a whole lot of other names for my mother-in-law, but sweet may not be on the list, right? Maybe it's a really good name or something, but you wouldn't say say sweet. Anyway, Naomi's name was, was sweet. And we get the idea that uh, that's, that's the kind of person she is. I mean, Ruth wants to stay with her. Orpah is, is, seems fine with her and that kind of thing. Uh, she has a good reputation when she goes back to her people and all of that. She probably was sweet, just like her name said. But Naomi said, but, but uh, she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, and Mara means bitter. Mara means bitter. Isn't that, isn't that life sometimes? Do you have a little bit of Naomi in you? <laughs> that was a rhetorical question. However, it can be a confessional question as well. Turn, turn to your neighbor and tell him you got a little bit of Naomi in you. Yeah. You got a little bit of Naomi in you. And, and, and you know what they'll say? They'll say, no, you're reading it all wrong. I'm not bitter. I'm just guarded. If they say that to you, say, well, you, you know, back where I'm from, we called it bitterness. Okay, that, watch what you're doing right now. Or, or they'll say, I'm not bitter. I'm just being honest. We just have to say, well, here. Your honesty looks a whole lot like bitterness. And there are times that we go through it. We've got a little bit of Naomi in us. You know what? I've got a little bit of Naomi in me as well. Yeah, in fact, I, I just, I just want to spill my heart out to you this morning. I've got some pet peeves. All right? Now, I've got two that I want to talk about this morning. The first one is this. Can people in the stores in this town learn how to walk in public? Uh, anybody with me on that? Are you going down the aisle and somebody stops right in front of you? It's like if you, you kind of got to go with the rules of the road when you're walking in a crowd. Walk on the right side, not on the left side. Pass on the left side, you know, that kind of thing. And if you're driving on the highway, you don't just stop in the middle of the highway and take pictures of the sunset, right? That causes problems. 
but I will find folks that will park their cart sideways in the middle of a busy style at Walmart and just kind of, they're not looking at anything in general, they're just looking up. And I'm just going, there's nothing to buy up there. Can you just please get out of the way? The rest of us would like to find what we're looking for. What you're not even looking in the right place to find what you're looking for, right? And I just, do you ever get a little grumpy in public like that? You just, just, you're walking in store. I know some of you work in Walmart. And so you probably get really frustrated with some of the folks that are in Walmart. Um, uh, and then... Uh, um, there are also times when, uh, when, I'm, when I'm just like, all of a sudden, I'll be walking on the right side and somebody with a cart is trying to text while they're in their cart and their cart's like coming right at me. And, and you know, I'm looking around, it's just me and the other person and they're like coming right at me and I'm like, Okay, time to throw down, dude. We're going to do this right here in Walmart, all right? Oh, my name will be on the front page of the paper. Pastor goes, you know, crazy on some Walmart, uh, Walmart shopper or something like that. So I, I've got a little bit of Ruth in me. You want, you want to know what the other pet peeve is? People with a lot of pet peeves. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's right. That's right. We can all be bitter from time to time. In fact, there are times when, when you and I just get, we just get to the place where we're done with people, don't we? we just get peopled out. You ever been done with people? You, you ever just come home and said, all right, if I see another person, hear another person, if another person tries to talk to me, I may just go nuts. I, 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 may, just, I may just go crazy. And you know what? The pandemic allowed us some freedom and allowed us some excuses to do that. In fact, uh, we were told not to go out for a few weeks, but then, you know, most of us were a little rebellious. If you'd have told us not to go out, we would have stayed home. Or if you'd have told us we had to go out, we would have stayed home. But since, since we were kind of told, hey, let's kind of hang out at home until we figure this thing out for a couple of weeks, uh, most of us wanted to go out, right? Uh, however, it allowed a good chunk of our country to decide, hey, we've got an excuse not to be around people. I don't have to go into work. Um, I can just Zoom call and things like that. And I don't have to see people. I can, I can order DoorDash. I've never ordered DoorDash before. But I've heard people say it like this. You can order DoorDash and pay for it online and pay for the tip online. So all you have to do, the only personal contact you have to have is, is that you look through the door thing until the person sets it down and walks away. And then you go out and reach it. And you don't even have to deal with a person, right? It allowed us that kind of freedom. People would post things like, you know, it's, it's more about dogs than about people, right? More about my cat than about people. It's more about being alone and, and all of that. However, during that time, mental health problems and mental health struggles skyrocketed and have stayed at that uh, level ever since. In fact, what we've found is that it is not healthy for us to not be around other people. It is not healthy for us to decide, in my life, I don't want anything to do with other people. In fact, um, some, uh, some counselors have found the more that we isolate ourselves, the more our thoughts begin to fold on themselves and become this death loop of thinking about uh, and that always seems to spiral down and down and down and down and leads to depression and leads to addiction and leads to all kinds of things. And it's almost as if we were made to be around people, right? Which scripture would agree with. Well, Ruth was committed to Naomi in a bad season. Na Naomi didn't want people around her. But Ruth said, where you go, I will go. And, and Naomi said, you don't get it. You don't get it. See, I'm tired of these people. I want to go back and be with my people. And she said, uh, I, I, I want to go back to be in my country. And she said, where you go, I will go. I'm tired of these people. I want to go back with the people I used to know. And she says, your people will be my people. 
He goes, no, you don't understand. We don't worship the same gods you worshiped there. And she goes, your gods will be my God. And then she looks at her and she says, you don't get it. I'm going home to die. Where you die, I'll die. You know, that's a beautiful statement. That's true commitment. That's an incredible commitment. That's the kind of commitment we would love other people make for us. And one of the reasons that sticks out to us, and that's, that's the kind of the passage that we know about this, this whole story, is because we rarely see this kind of commitment to each other. We don't see it in our world. We don't see people that say, where you go, I'll go. Whatever you do, I'll do. No, we, we, we say it this way. Until you frustrate me, I'm along for the ride. Right? Until I get a little bit miffed at something that you do, I'm, I'm game. But here we have Ruth doing something that is incredible and powerful. And during this time... Naomi is going through a bad season. To counteract what our world thinks, our world thinks that the issue, because we have problems in our relationships, then the issue is that we should distance ourselves from our relationships. We should distance ourselves from people. Scripture is very different. And you can find passages in Scripture that make our relationship with God all about a spiritual, quiet lonely relationship with God. And believe me, you need times like that. And, and Dwight just talked about it. You need times where it's just you and God. But you also need other people. In fact, if, if you have to really take some scriptures out of context to say that it's just a spiritual venture. We find scripture all over the place that says we are built for a relationship. In fact, here is one that is extremely powerful. And it's from James chapter 5 and verse 6. And it says this. It says, therefore, confess your sins to God, right? We understand that. We should confess our sins to God, right? Because God can forgive our sins. And, you know, we should keep our sins from other people. Because don't nobody need to know about that stuff, right? Nobody needs to know about that. But is that what this passage says? I think there's some crickets out there that are even quiet. All right. And it says, therefore, confess your sins to each other. What? I'm not going to do that, Josh. You don't need to know my junk. And just, believe, just between you and I, I don't want to know your junk. All right. Well, uh, therefore, confess your sins to each other. Why would we do that? Isn't it God that forgives sins? Let's, let's just little theology 101. Who forgives sins? God forgives sins, right? Now, I can forgive you of a sin that you commit against me, but I can't absolve you of your sin, right? The only person that can absolve you of your sin is God. And so, yes, we need to confess our sins to God, but this says confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. And why does it say that? So that you may be healed. When I pray and confess my sins to God... My sins are forgiven, washed white as snow, clean. Um, uh, they, they are absolved. They are taken care of. Now, I may still need to deal with some of that if it's caused problems between other people or harmed other people. I may still need to, to deal with that. But God cleanses us of our sins. When we, in faith, ask him to forgive us our sins, he forgives them. Isn't that incredible news? God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, Scripture says. But we confess to each other and it brings healing. Healing. Let me just tell you, it is no wonder in our world that mental health issues have skyrocketed. Because we are isolated from each other more and more every day. And let me tell you what, connection isn't, there is a way to be connected online, but online connection is not true connection. It's a partial connection. It's a start of a connection. And often it is a very fake connection. We confess to each other and listen, God seems to be fine with this, right? Right? Because there's a command in scripture that says, <laughs> yeah, God says, 
I don't mind if you confess your sins to each other. In fact, I kind of want that because you need healing. So God forgives us of our sins in a moment when we ask him to forgive us of our sins. But God also knows this about you. That your brokenness goes beyond just, I did something wrong. Your brokenness goes to a place where you need the help of godly people to heal in relationships that are healthy as well. You and I need that. The healthiest person in this room, the healthiest among us, need other people through whom God works... That we might confess our brokenness, confess our sin. That we might pray for each other and be healed. Man, could we use that? Could we use that in the United States today? And here, it's no wonder that Satan has most of our society convinced, I don't need other people. In fact, I don't want other people. In fact, I'm growing more and more. So that I don't like other people. I don't want other people. And there's a very narrow swath of people I would accept anyway. Because the rest of them are just dumb. Have you convinced yourself of this stuff? Have you kind of convinced yourself of this? You know, why isn't everybody just like me? Am I the... I heard this out of somebody's mouth the other day. Am I the only intelligent person in this world? I just kind of said, I don't think you want the answer to that. (laughs) We can convince ourselves that we're the stuff and everybody else is just an idiot out there. You know what? That is Satan telling us. You don't need connections with anybody. That person can't help you. That person can't help you. That person can't help you. In fact, it will be, Satan will build in your mind the picture-perfect uh, relationship that you need of the person that can help you. And they glow. And they always say the right thing. And they always kind of agree with you. In fact, we need healthy relationships. Now listen, let me just help you. If you're not a Christian, you might go, you know, I've got kind of a version of this. And I've got some buddies that I just complain to and then they complain back and they kind of agree with me and we just all complain together. That is not what this is talking about. In fact, in the midst of Christian conversation, you're you're welcome to complain. But here's what here's part of what will happen is that is that we'll begin to probe each other and to say, Are you sure you're coming at that from the right perspective? Could you maybe be seeing this the wrong way? Confession is not about just blurting things out so that someone will agree with me. Confession is to say, here's where I'm broken and here's what needs to be fixed and here's the sin I've done. And and in fact, there's some sins I haven't done that I want to do. And here are some things, some habits that I've been building in my life. And here are some things that I need somebody's help to stop me. A uh, good friend of mine that died a couple of years ago, I had a, a, a pretty close relationship with him. I was meeting with him once a month, and we'd known each other for 30 some odd years and things like that. And on big decisions in my life, I, I would go, Bill, what do you think I should do? And he'd say, pray. He'd never help me with the big decisions. He'd say, I think you need to pray. And I said, Bill, don't you care about me? Why do you just tell me to pray? And he goes, because I want God to tell you the answer. And once God tells you the answer and you come around to his wisdom and you decide to go there, then I'm all in with you. Because if you're being obedient with God, I'll say, hey, man, here's some ideas about how we can do this. And I'm all in. I'm with you. But I'm not going to stand by and give you advice so that I become your surrogate. You need to develop a relationship with God where he gives you the wisdom for this. That's the kind of relationships that we need. Let me just say this to you. And I want to make this bold statement. I want to say this. Healthy community is the most responsible and proactive thing you can do for your own mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Bar none. Now listen, I am all for doctors and medication when it needs to be applied and things like that. But healthy relationships, healthy relationships, healthy godly relationships will heal you. Thank you. Thank you. Man, some of y'all making me preach this alone, but but, uh, no, no, no. Sessie's going to make sure I'm not. All right. 
Here's another thing that I want you to notice about this story. Ruth chooses community before she experiences community. I'll go with you. But you don't know what my neighbors are like. <laughs> have, you, have you ever become friends with someone and thought, this is the exact kind of friend I need, and then you met their other friends, and you thought, oh, no. Have I made, oh, I'm, wow. Get what Ruth is saying. She says, yeah, I'll go live where you live. You ain't seen my neighborhood, all right? And then she says, your people will be my people. <laughs> they go, wait until they meet, she meets my people. <laughs> well, we'll put that to the test, right? You know what Ruth didn't say was, hey, um, you know what? I think we'll go try this out for a week. And we'll see how it works. Because, you know, I'm a little picky about the people I'm around. And uh, I probably won't like some of them, so I'll just go see if I can work this out so that it's to my benefit. Ruth says ahead of time, I'm going. My commitment's to you. She commits to community on the front end. Now, listen, that is hard for us to do. Is there anybody in here that's just a little bit skeptical of people? Anybody? Anybody? I mean, if you've lived over five years and, you know, had some things not go your way, you're probably a little skeptical of people. Can I just tell you this? That if you walk into a group of people and you are skeptical of that group of people, you are going to find evidence to prove your skepticism. Yeah, okay, I will give you plenty of reasons to doubt whether you should have relationships with people or not. I just want you to know that. Um, You'll be walking in front of me someday and slow down in the hallway. And I will give you a reason to, to say, I knew it. Pastors are all jerks. Pastors are all jerks. Look at that guy. He's mad all the time. I, well, all I was doing, well, I just was walking full speed, then just stopped. That's all I did. And here, I just want you to know that if you're looking for reasons to be skeptical of community, you'll find it. But if you are looking for reasons to find God's healing work through healthy relationships, listen to me, you'll have to work for it. You'll have to work with it. You'll have to put up with some people doing people things so that you can get beyond the people things to the sharing of hearts. Because guess what? You'll do some people things too. You just will. Ruth chose community before she experienced community and if you're thinking right now but I've tried this before and I've been burned can I just tell you that the best way to deal with that is not to get away from community but to experience healthy community here's the trouble with community I can tell you about it but I cannot describe it to you you know community when you've had community. And you know when it's just been a fake conversation with somebody, right? You know when you've shared hearts. You know when you've shared minds. You know when you've shared the best. And that's what God wants for you. Healing in your life. Um, there's... Uh, there's something that I want you to know. One of the most radical things we can do as a church is to be hospitable to people, welcoming to people. I think, I think uh, to a great extent, um, our church is. I talked to a new family that's uh, been coming for several weeks and, and got to spend uh, some time with them. And I said, what, 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 do you, what do you think about our church so far? And they said, say, they are so welcoming, so friendly, so kind. And so I just want to say, because they're not here today, I just want to say to you, Thank you, but what did you do last week? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure why they're not here. No, their son plays baseball. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, keep that up. But one of the most radical things we can do in a, in a world full of Naomi's, we need to be a church full of Ruth's. Our skepticism about people is not built on the same thing. In a world of people who only desire, whose only desire is to be alone, we must be a church who offers connection. Fellowship, community. Um, 
we're, we're going to jump over a whole bunch of story just because we don't have time because I know you've got reservations for mom and, uh, and all that kind of thing. And if you don't have reservations and you're going to a restaurant, good luck today. All right. Just want to want to say that's wow, that's brave of you. All right. But but now we're going to jump to later in their life. So not only is Naomi helped out, but Ruth is helped out in this also. They actually meet a husband for Ruth and um, and and the this husband is called a kinsman redeemer there's all, all kinds of things behind it you'll we'll have to talk about that someday um, uh, but she meets a husband and um, actually has a child and so let's I, I want to jump there for for a specific reason and so uh, so Ruth chapter 4 verses 6 through 17 so Boaz this is the the gentleman by the way Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. <laughs> wow, happy ending, happy ending to the story, right? Uh, the, women, uh, the women of Naomi's town said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian, redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who, who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Now listen, I'm a son. I take offense to that. I'm a pretty good son. I, you know, no, I'm just kidding. There is, there is something about the way Ruth is that now becomes better than blood relationship. There, there is something about Ruth's commitment to Naomi that now becomes, now becomes stronger than a mom's relationship with her son. Um, but, but here's the exciting part, because Naomi comes back in. Remember, Naomi said, call me Mara, because I'm bitter, right? But then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The, living, uh, the women living there said, Naomi has a son. Not Mara, not Mara, right? Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. And he was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. Now listen, if you're new to the Bible and that kind of thing, you've heard of David before. Yeah. David was like... Israel's spectacular king. And here's how this works out. So Ruth has another mother-in-law in this whole thing. Um, it is not just Naomi. Naomi is the mother-in-law on one side, but there's a pretty important biblical story that shows us who Ruth's other mother-in-law is. And Ruth's other mother-in-law was also from Moab, and her name happens to be Rahab, who also needed community and needed God's help and had to choose those to trust God first in order to receive community. And her faithfulness enables Ruth's faithfulness to combine to help Naomi out. And Naomi takes this child in her arms and everyone around her says, ah, not only does she have a grandbaby, but we've gotten Naomi back. She's no longer Mara. Listen, some of you right now are thinking, I can't do this. Listen, I'm an introvert. You got you to gotta understand this. I'm not a people person. Are you with me? Some of you with me? I'm not a people person. Or, or, or you're like this. Some of the times I'm a people person, but at work. And that's all I can do. That's all I can do. I've got enough people person in me to, so that at the end of the day at work, I just want, I just want to get away from everybody. You, you, I don't want to be around people anymore. Now, of course, you're around your husband, but he's not really a person, right? No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, uh, let, me, let me just help you this with something here. You know why Ruth can do this? Because God can do this. You know what God is about? People. God is for people. 
Some of you don't realize, so some of you don't realize that and, and, and understand that, that Christians believe that God is for people. God is pro people. God is for you. God wants the best for you. You go, wait a minute, then why is God against all the things that I like? I mean, why is he pretty strong against most of the things that I like? And let me just tell you, because he's for you. Because some of the things that he's, because the things that he's definitely against are things that will damage you, that will hurt you, that will harm you. And you know what? He loves you more than anything. He loves you. Some of you that are parents can understand the way that God loves you. In fact, multiply your love for your child by a hundred times and you still won't reach God's love for you. But you understand this. There are things your child definitely wants that you know that your child definitely does not need, right? And so you keep that thing from your child. Why? Not because you hate your child, because you love your child. God's for you. God loves you. And God wants you connected with other people that can help you be healthy. Because it breaks God's heart when we're just isolated and we're caught in this death loop of thinking that says, says, says you know, it's, the world's bad. Oh, it's bad. It's terrible. It's bad. It's terrible. Who'd want to live in a place like this? In fact, I don't want to live in a place like this. In fact, I don't want to live. And we can just be in that death loop longer and longer and longer and when we're isolated. And we need somebody who, who also has real skin on, who can be God's representative for us in a moment and go, snap out of it, pal. Come on. God has redeemed you. God has prepared for you. And God loves you. We need to be reminded of that. We need to have times in our lives where we go, but you don't understand what I've done. And they say, come on, bring it to me. You tell me what you've done. You tell me all the dirt. Josh, you tell me all the dirt. Because there's no dirt that you could tell me that would make me say, I don't want to talk to Josh anymore. Let me just tell you, where you go, I'll go. Your people will be my people. You die, I'll die. We're there with, us, with, with each other, right? Do you believe that God can work healing in our lives through other people? Look at the other person next to you and go, I believe God can even use you. Yeah, God can use you. Now turn to the other person on the other side and say, I'm praying about you. No, no I'm just kidding. God can do it. Now listen, listen, after this, you're going to be tempted to leave this place and, and, and you're going to be tempted to fall into what Satan wants you to do. And you go, did you see what so-and-so was wearing today? Or did you know what so-and-so did? You know what thus and such did? You know what? All of those are people that God created and called and God claimed and God cleansed. And people that we need to not, not target, we need to love and pull together in a world that is full of people that say, don't talk to me today, I'm bitter. We need some folks that like Ruth can say, I don't care if you're bitter or not. Uh, where you go, I'll go. And I won't let you go. Where you die, I'll die. And we will be the people of God. Because guess what? Your health and my health and my healing depends on God speaking through you to me and vice versa. And I'm not going to miss out on that. How about you? How about you? Hey, man, somebody who's made it a, a, a decision to follow Jesus, who understands this, that he didn't make a move to God, but that God made a move towards him, right? That's the way God works. God makes the first move all the time. He makes a move towards us. Is Ethanel, and I'm going to have him come on up here because we're going to have us a baptism. We're going to have us a baptism. Is that the vote count? Come on up. And Nellie, would you come on up? And uh, did you guys want to come up with them too? You want to come on up here? No, that's good. You're trying, are you trying to tell me something about your parents? What is, I will tell every word you say up here, up to, to them, just, just to tell you. All right. So let me just, let's just go with this. 
Um, 78 votes cast, and I'm not told how many were cast for each person, but the three people that were voted to serve a three-year term are Jennifer Bedwell, Clyde Pritchett, and Noah Wiggler. Okay, fantastic. Yes, give them a round of applause. For those of you that were not elected to the board, we're thankful for your willingness to serve. And, uh, but um, we also will tell you when you need to start showing up, okay? Let me get my piece of paper out for all of this. Um, so in just a moment, if you've been baptized, in just a moment, not right yet, I'm going to have you stand as well. But I just want to tell you that Christian baptism is a sacrament that signifies particip participation by faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and incorporation into his body, into the community of Christ, the church. This means of grace proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It is a means of grace proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, the, the Apostle Paul declares that all who are baptized into Christ Jesus are baptized into his death. We're buried with him through baptism, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too are raised and walk in newness of life. As we have been united with him in his death, we also will be united with him in his resurrection. I'm going to read um, the Apostles' Creed. And if you have been, if you're a Christian and you've been baptized, I want you to stand with me while we read uh, this together. Let's just renew our baptismal vows, okay? Here's what it says. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell, and then the third day rose again from the, de from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. And the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Have you been baptized into this faith? If so, say, we have. Yes. Will you be baptized into this faith? If so, say, I will. I will. Cheer for him and then have a seat. Yeah. All right. Nelly, your pastora is going to read the next few questions for you. All right. I'm going to have her do that. Okay. Ethanel, do you know acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord or Savior, and do you believe that He saved you now? I will in my faith. Amen. Okay. Another question is: As member of the ch Church of Jesus Christ, will you follow Him all the days of your life, growing in grace and the love of God and neighbor? Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. Yes. Well, we're going to go back and get ready for the other two. Uh, um, so much like I remember what we were going to do next. Well, while I'm doing that, I want to talk about that important thing. All right. <laughs> so as a little filler, I, uh, I did remember uh, what it was that I wanted to say. <laughs> so, you know, you get old, you forget. So it was, am I, am I driven by whatever it is that I, need, that I think I need to do, or am I drawn? Am I being drawn by the Spirit of the Lord into what He's asking me to do, how to spend my time? Okay? Each and every one of us uh, has a moment where we have a choice to make. Will I follow Jesus or, or not? And Ethan Ellis made that, that choice. God gives us that, doesn't he? In his grace, in his mercy, he says, I'm, I'm not just going to capture you and make you my follower. I'm going to give you a choice. And Ethan Ellis has chosen to follow Jesus. And so today, Ethan Ellis, 
I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Woo! Come on out. All right. Stand with us as we worship together, folks.